Do you believe time is almost finished? Do you believe we're living in the last days? Do you believe it? Kneel with me as we spend a few moments in prayer at this time. Father in heaven, it's time for thee, Lord, to work. I pray that you will agitate, agitate, agitate every mind today, that you will educate, educate, educate every mind today. I pray for the holy angels to hover over this place. We pray for the Holy Spirit to take full control of every mind that is surrendered. I pray for revival. I pray for reformation today. Grant us Bible repentance. May you arouse us. May you arouse us. Please, Lord, arouse each one of us. May we see our great need today. Pour out your spirit upon us. We thank you for what you will do is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Let's get right into this. I'm not going to be able to cover everything that the Lord has laid upon my heart. The hour is late. The literal hour is late, as well as the spiritual hour is late. And as Romans chapter 13 says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to be awakened out of sleep. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. The Bible says, cast off the works of darkness. And what are we to put on? The armor of light. It's time, brothers and sisters. And let me just say this. The Bible gives us a warning in Jeremiah chapter 23. And it's a great woe, brothers and sisters. What is it? It's a great woe in Jeremiah chapter 23. And the Bible is clear. It says, woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter my sheep. A great woe. And all these ministers who are now placating apostasy, their day is coming, brothers and sisters. All those who are labeling God's messengers as offshoots, let me tell you something. Their day is coming. The black balls are going to come more frequently. The black balls are going to be more forceful. And unless we have our own individual, personal walk with Jesus, we're going to be shaken out. You're going to be sifted out of this truth because we're living in a time where the leadership of this SDA movement despise present truth. They despise a forceful protest against their apostasy. And I want to be very clear. In the DNA of Seventh-day Adventists is something called Protestantism. It's something called a protest. And anywhere apostasy, public apostasy is, we must put our finger and we must call sin by its right name. Regardless of feelings. Regardless of position. Regardless of of how they want to label us. God is looking for men, men with backbone, yes. spiritual stamina, men that will call sin by its right name. And take a look at this. Last Sabbath, by the way, quickly, this is tomorrow on February 27th, our work of aggressive, effective evangelism. All right? You all know that. Won't spend time on that. Notice here, friend, last Sabbath, I mentioned the president of Zambia, a professed Seventh-day Adventist. And as you can see the words on the screen, Seventh-day Adventist trending in the news. For the right reasons, you tell me. For the wrong reasons, you tell me. 
I got two things I want to cover today. Notice what this goes on to say. Now, last Sabbath, I touched on President Ichalima, who went to pay a visit to the Pope at the Vatican on God's seventh-day Sabbath. Let me be clear to everyone today. Any position, any civil position in the world that will lead me to violate and desecrate God's seven-day Sabbath, you can keep it. I don't want it. I don't want it. And if the office of the president is going to cause me to miss church, miss worship, violate, desecrate God's seven-day Sabbath, I would rather be nobody than to be somebody and be lost. For the Bible says, what shall it profit a man? To gain the whole world, Matthew 16, and lose his own soul, what shall it profit a man to become a president of a nation and lose his own soul? By the way, so I guess people began to see the video. Now notice, met with the Pope, come on, all right, there he is, a professed Seventh-day Adventist. I covered that on this past Sabbath, and the headline says, Zambia's president acknowledges a Catholic Church as a beacon of hope and the nation's conscience. I'm not going to reiterate what I covered last Sabbath. The video is there. I won't spend much time. I have a lot to cover today, my friends. The cup is full. Are you ready for God's word? Look at this. Zambia reports. This is a letter from the Northern Zambia Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And friends, please, just, 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 just allow me to state this. The actual print and resolution of the letter is in poor quality. I did my best to type out the words. But notice, again, just in case, the headline there, it's right there, just in case you missed it, SDA defends the president, President Ichalima's visit to the Pope. Next. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in Zambia has defended the president's visit to the Vatican to meet Pope Francis on last week. The church has also stated that the purported, purport, purported SDA pastor who went viral on social media when he condemned the visit is no longer a member of the church. Now, what video are they talking about that went viral? Since they did not state it, I will not conjecture. They're acting as if we don't know. And what they're trying to do is try to be subtle and cunning and deceptive at the same time in not calling out the specific person and ministry that has criticized correctly this apostasy. It's no different, my friends, no different. But notice in the Bible, when there was an apostate leader, did Nathan not put his finger on the sore and said, David, thou art the man? Is that not what Nathan did, the prophet? When you know what truth is, you, are, you aren't afraid to cause sin by its right name and to connect and to connect the apostates with that public apostasy. You remember John the Baptist, my friends? Did they label? Did they view John the Baptist as being in the church of God? They did not view John the Baptist as being a part of God's church. Why? Why? Because John the Baptist was purporting a forceful remonstration against apostasy. When John saw Herod, king of the Jews, right? King, a civil office, right? When John saw Herod trying to get into an adulterous relationship with Herodias. What did John the Baptist say? Huh? Leave that woman alone. Why? You are committing spiritual adultery. And what am I saying today? The president of Zambia, a professed Seventh-day Adventist, he's committing spiritual adultery with Popery, the harlot power, and Herodias represents a modern-day Popery. By the way, God gives a stern rebuke. Revelation chapter 2. Look with me at verse number, verse number 20, 21. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she 
repented not. Instead of the Northern Zambia Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists apologizing for this public ap apostasy, they doubled down on the apostasy. Look at verse number 22, Revelation 2. Behold, Jesus says, I will cast her into a bed, and them that what? What will God do to Popery? Cast her into what, friends? A bed. That's destruction. And them that commit what? Adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and heart, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. All right. Listen to what it goes on to say. We wish to reaffirm. Are they double down? Did they double down on this? We wish to reaffirm our position that Mr. Hichalima is a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. However, we would like to clarify that while Mr. Hichalima is a Seventh-day Adventist, typo, he's also a Republican president with state duties to perform, and therefore, the two should not be mixed. Did you, did you catch that, my friends? So once you become a civil servant, you must lay aside your religious affiliation, your religious faith. Is that not heresy, brothers and sisters? And notice, since it's coming from the leaders of the SDA Union Conference, it is heresy at the highest level. That's it. Do we have biblical examples of God's people, providentially, who became civil leaders? Who are some of them? What about Joseph? Did Joseph lay aside his spiritual beliefs and faith because he was a civil leader. What about Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah? Pause right there. The list is long. This is apostasy, brothers and sisters. And what they're trying to do is to silence the protest. And what is one of the aims of Popery? Is it not to destroy Protestantism? So like Popery, Seventh-day Adventists. Hope you caught that. Like Popery, Jesuitism to overthrow Protestantism, the Seventh-day Adventist leaders in Zambia are doing the very same thing. All right, second paragraph. Seventh-day Adventists have a very clear, balanced, and biblical ecclesio ecclesio ecclesiological self-understanding which doesn't include a sense of superiority or paranoia towards people from other faith communities. That's a straw man argument, as if we hate people. Straw man argument. Listen, therefore, the Zambian public is hereby notified that the criticism against an Adventist head of state for visiting the Pope does not represent a Seventh-day Adventist position. So would they support then? Ganundia, shaking hands with the Pope. Would they support then? Elder Ted Wilson, visiting and shaking the hands of the Pope. That's what they said. And sometimes, because the apostasy and the public apostate are in other countries. We in America, in the Western countries, we think to say it's not a big deal. As if God, as if Jesus is prejudiced or racist. All of us are God's people, brothers and sisters. Apostasy must be checked wherever it is found. All right, notice, we would also like to address the viral video purported to have made by a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. <laughs> Our position is that the pastor in the said video is not a bona fide. What does that mean? <laughs> My friends, 
not a bona fide minister of the gospel in our church and does not in any way represent or speak on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist church. My friends, if I am going to be labeled as a bona fide SDA minister and to support apostasy, I'd rather be called someone not connected to this Seventh-day Adventist church. I'd rather to be called an extremist. I'd rather to be called an offshoot. I'd rather to be called a fanatic than to be called a bona fide minister that supports Seventh-day Adventists uniting with Jesuitism. Seventh-day Adventists uniting with Pope. That's apostasy, brothers and sisters. And officially, the Seventh-day Adventist church there in Zambia and elsewhere publicly are telling us they no longer support true biblical Protestantism and those who promote Protestantism. Notice, due to his extreme positions on many biblical and theological beliefs in which he has been antagonizing the church and calling church leadership names. The man ceased a long time ago. The man ceased a long time ago to be in good and regular standing with the Seventh-day Adventist church. They're speaking as if they know me. They don't know me. They're, go know Jesus, my friends. Tell them, go know Christ. Go and study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Know that, brothers and sisters. You don't know my history. You don't know who I am. And notice what they went on to say. That man ceased a long time ago to be in good and regular standing with the Seventh-day Adventist. What does that mean? To be in good and regular standing. Hmm? Are we to now deduce the fact that those who they say are in good and regular standing in the SDA church are those who support what? Apostasy. All right. Notice. Should I spend time on this? Beloved, every institution that bears the name of what? Seventh-day Adventist. Must be to the world as whom? Joseph was in Egypt. Daniel, the three Hebrews down there in Babylon. Look at this. Black words. In the providence of God, these men were taken captive that they might carry to the heathen nations. To whom? The heathen nations, the knowledge of the true God. Red words. They were to make what? I didn't hear you. They were to make no compromise with the idolatrous nations with which they were brought in contact. All right, and then it mentions principles for God's seven-day Sabbath. When the president of Zambia went to the Vatican, it was not looking at the, uh, the pope as head of state, but the pope as head of church. Because he referred to the pope as uh, the Holy Father. And that the Catholic doctrine he believes in and also espouse. Brothers and sisters, what are we told? It's a backsliding church that lessens its distance between itself and the Roman Catholic Church. That's it, brothers and sisters. You hold on. Were there civil leaders in, in, in Europe that repelled and repulsed the papacy? even though they were civil servants? Yes. Who were those? Those people were the German princes. That's our model. Not the Zambian president, the professed SDA. Let me pass this. Notice, this is President Echelima thanking the Catholic Church for what? Good doctrine. Not head of state now. The Catholic Church... Not good policy, but what? Good doctrine. All right. Notice, red words, underlined. And what did he host? 
at the State House, a Roman Catholic Mass. 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 Brothers and sisters, what are we told about the Mass? The scriptural ordinance of the Lord's Supper had been supplanted by the idolatrous, the what, friend? Idolatrous sacrifice of the Mass. Brothers and sisters, pass that. With blasphemous presumption, that's what he's supporting. Red words, Christians were required on pain of death to avow their faith in this horrible, heaven-insulting what? Heresy. So what was the Zambian president supporting? Heaven-insulting heresy. And if you do this, you're in good and regular standing with the SDA church. It says, multitudes who refused were thrown away in the flames. And what are the next blue words, next sentence? What was connected to the Catholic Mass? Brothers and sisters, it says, the Roman Catholic Inquisition, and which group of Catholics were the ones that championed the Inquisition? It was the Jesuit order. And who did the Zambian president support, promote, and exhort the Jesuits of the Roman Catholic Church? They go together. That's apostasy, brothers and sisters. No, 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 no. I need a stronger word. That is an abomination. Amen. All right. How much more? Pass that. Drinking wine. The wine. False doctrine. I wonder if he drank some papal wine too. At the state house. Huh? False doctrine. Is he drunk with papal wine? Is he drunk? Now notice. Red words. Promoting the Jesuit order. Pass that. Notice. And what is the purpose of Jesuitism? To overthrow Protestantism. Is that point clear, my friends? Now watch carefully now. It says, I want to go somewhere. It says, watch carefully. We therefore reiterated our resolve to working with what church? Didn't say work with the Holy See. The political arm. It's talking about the religious arm. We will always look up to the Roman Catholic Church for guidance in dealing with national matters. Brothers and sisters, the letter ended by saying this. From the Northern Zambia Union Conference, they write, we as a church, we will continue to monitor and interpret prudently significant and current trends. Where? In the religious and political world that may, may, typo, that may impact what? Religious liberty. That sounds good, right? We will focus on current events to see events that will encroach upon what red words? Religious liberty. Brothers and sisters, who does God word, God's word label as the greatest foe of our religious liberty? Who is it? Look at the screen for yourself, my friends. Watch carefully. Red words. The people, let's read. The people need to be aroused to what? Hug? Shake hands. Visit. I heard someone say, we should visit. Nothing is wrong with paying the Pope a visit and giving, giving a Jesuit Pope the book Great Controversy. You think the Pope doesn't know about the book Great Controversy? Are you ignorant or something? The papacy, a Jesuit, knows who the rival power and church really is. The people need to be what? Aroused to resist the what? The advances, the advances of this most what? Dangerous foe to what? Civil and religious liberty. But wait a minute. What did they just write and say? We are going to focus now on religious and political 
trending events that may impact religious liberty. At the same time, you are uniting with the very power that is the greatest foe of religious liberty. Are they not inebriated? Are they not drunk? They are drinking from the wine cup of Babylon. And those who refuse to go along with this agenda are going to be labeled as what, brothers and sisters? Not in good and regular standing in the church. Friends, welcome to the true remnant. Welcome to the faithful remnant. It says, uh, blue words, uh, we will maintain. We will what? These men won't change. Flee. Matthew 15, Jesus says, let the blind alone. If the blind follow the blind, both shall fall in a ditch. We will maintain our what? Ongoing interactions. In, that is adultery spiritually with leaders of the other faith communities. Protestants have tempered with and what? Patronize, patronize popery. They have made what, friends? Compromises and concessions which papists themselves, which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. Imagine what Pope Francis must have thought when a Zambian president a professed Seventh-day Adventist paid him a visit on the Sabbath and said, you, your doctrines will be the conscience of civil policies in Zambia. The Pope must be smiling inside. I gotcha. I have you in my grasp. Protestantism is done. Now go back and be my spokesperson. Go back and be my ambassador. Go back and silence all those who are vilifying and protesting against our solidarity. Black words on the line. Men are closing their what? Their eyes. Their eyes to the real character of Romanism. And the dangers to be apprehended from her what? Supremacy. The people need to be aroused. One more time. The people need what, friends? Do you see why I'm emphasizing this? The people need to be aroused. To what? To resist the advances of this most dangerous foe of civil to civil and religious liberties. And that's why many of these SDA leaders despise the book, Great Controversy, the whole book, despise the writings of Ellen White. Do you know why now? Do you see why now, friends? Do you see why now? Because, by the way, I wonder, is this man even a closet Catholic? Look at the screen here. Are they trending in the news for the right reason? Or the wrong reason. What do you say now? What do you say now, friends? And what is on the right of that screen? <laughs> what happened at Oakwood Academy last Sabbath? You know what? I'm going to leave that basketball thing alone for now, the sports, because many, let me just say this in passing, friends, many are saying it was great for the youth on the basketball team of Oakwood Academy to say we will not play on the seven-day Sabbath. Now, they don't know any better. They're ignorant. It's the leaders, the parents, that should be blamed for this apostasy. And those who applaud that are ignorant. And why do I say that? Does God need his people to violate one principle in order to exalt another principle? Is that what we're saying? Contextually, this went on CNN, viral news, all over. 
Alabama, CNN, all over, saying they're standing for the seven-day Sabbath because of a semifinals basketball game. In other words, they want to play sports, competition, simple ball playing. It's not condemned by God, but when we get into competitive sports, the spirit of rivalry, the spirit of pride, let me put the nail in a sure place. And who shall be the greatest? Was on the mind of Christ's disciples just before the cross. So as we are approaching the second coming of Christ, the mark of the beast, church and state union, what will be on the mind of God's professed people who shall be the greatest secondly what did paul write in first corinthians chapter 9 many who run in a race many run in a race but how many get the prize one only one get the prize in contrast paul says now but we can run another race and how many can win a prize how many can receive not a corruptible crown, but an incorruptible crown? All. That's Bible, brothers and sisters. Yet yeah, many are saying, I don't see anything wrong with sports from the Bible. What? It's because you're blind. You're blind. So should I go into Hollywood? The sins of Hollywood? And now, one day, here comes a video shoot, but the video shoot is on the seven-day Sabbath. And now, I'm going to protest. I want to uphold my Sabbath question. What are you doing in Hollywood? What are you doing in Hollywood? That's the question. God does not want his people to violate one standard in order to elevate another standard. Imagine, do we need to sin to preach God's Sabbath? Would the loud cry be given when people are breaking a principle? No, we stand for God's principles, brothers and sisters. It's that point, oh, they're witnessing to the governor of Alabama. The governor of Alabama must have Jews in her constituency. The Jews on a what day for the most part? The seven-day Sabbath. Don't be foolish, brothers and sisters. People know. People know, and we shouldn't violate one to exhort another. Why? If you break one, you're guilty of how many? I didn't hear you. You're guilty of how many? If you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. And let me say this. What do they call those basketball stars, Hollywood stars, sports? They call them idols, brothers and sisters. Idols. It is idolatry. It is idolatry. How much time and money? Stop! Cut that. You get the point, brothers and sisters. Seventh-day Adventists trending in the news for the right reasons now? Huh? And I hope we understand when God raised up Seventh-day Adventism, our schools, what was their manual training? What, was, what were they given for exercise? For exercise, sports, again, not simple ball playing, little shooting hoops or whatever, but to get into competition, condemned by God's word. Look at the word sports all throughout the Bible, play, P-L-A-Y, all throughout scripture. It was farming, agriculture, that's it, manual training, brothers and sisters. Is that point clear? Amen. Is that point clear? Who shall be the greatest? And sports competition began where? With Satan in heaven. I was appalled when I saw various so-called present truth news outlets applauding the, the, the basketball stance of these young people. These were profess, uh, present truth media outlets, and it dawned on me. They will protest against other sins. But when there's a situation that criticizes their darling sins, they remain silent. In other words, 
many of them are guilty of loving competitive sports. How many of them were watching the NFL? Uh, what, um, the Super Bowl. Same spirit of the world. And now is coming the NBA playoffs and finals. How many are going to be involved watching that foolishness? And then they're going to say, um, don't give me spirit of prophecy. Don't show me anything from anyone. Just give me Bible. Do you know why? Do you know why, friends? They want, they want to justify themselves in error. Can I move on? So are they trending in the news? For what reason? Good reasons? Or for the wrong reasons? Oh, brothers and sisters, very, very soon, these same governors, these same governors will restrict our liberties for honoring the seven-day Sabbath. Oh, you all missed that. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That dragon power represents the civil leaders. That dragon power represents the governors. Is that point clear, my friends? Now notice what this says. What are these words right here, friends? We'll get a second chance after the second coming. How many folks believe that? Go to Matthew 24 with me. How many folks believe that, brothers and sisters? A second chance. But that's how many of us are living. I've just segue. That's how many of us are living. I just made a transition. That's how many of us are living. We're living as if we will receive a second chance, a second opportunity to be saved after the second coming of Christ. We don't have that time. It is now that we must make our calling and election sure for Christ. It is now when? It is now when? Matthew 24. What says verse 14? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. And what says Revelation 14? That shows us this gospel of the kingdom that ushers in the second coming of Christ is the three angels' messages from verse 6 through verse 16 of Revelation chapter 14. But what is Satan's plan, my sister? It is Satan's plan to hinder God's plan to get souls prepared for the mark of the beast crisis, to get souls prepared to die in Christ and not die in sin. It is Satan's plan to hinder God's plan. So people won't be ready for the second coming of Christ. Great controversy. Page 518 says, to hold the people in darkness and impenitence until the Savior's mediation is ended and there's no longer a sacrifice for sin is the object that Satan seeks to accomplish. And that's why 2 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We're not what, friends? We are, by the way, let me quote that. Put it down, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse number 11, God's word says, lest Satan should have an advantage over us. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. And brothers and sisters, one of Satan's devices, one of Satan's deception is the false theory of a secret rapture. A what rapture? 
Beloved, there is going to be a rapture. Yes, there's going to be a rapture. Rapture simply means to be caught up. To be what? Caught up. There's going to be a rapture. But it won't be secret. It won't be secret. It won't be hidden. It's going to be public. Have you ever seen a private lightning flash in the sky? Have you ever seen a private lightning flash in the sky? Have you ever seen that? Well, Jesus says, uh, as the lightning flashes from east to west, even so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And with the secret rapture is connected a false teaching called left behind. Left behind, left behind. And what does that mean? To be left behind means those people, after the second coming takes place, those people will have a second chance to be saved. Left behind at the second coming of Christ, you'll have a second opportunity, a second bite at the apple, as they say, a second time of probation. That's not Bible doctrine. That's false doctrine. Look at the screen here, friends. Are these points clear so far? What is that on the line for the headline? The secret rapture, brothers and sisters. Did they have books about the secret rapture? Mm -hmm. Secret rapture. Did they have books called Left Behind? Was there also a movie a movie sequel called Left Behind. Yes, brothers and sisters, watch carefully, watch carefully. Blue words, Left Behind, tells the story of the end times in which who? True believers in Christ have been what? Raptured. Get some education today, friends. Learn something today. When you come to church, get substance. They have been raptured, taken instantly to heaven red words now but there is some group of people called the tribulation force who are they what is their aim to help save whom the lost <laughs> and prepare for what the coming tribulation why is this so important as you can see a second chance by the way i'll come back to the blue words imagine you are giving a Bible study, listen to me, professed Seventh-day Adventist teachers, preachers, and medical missionary evangelists. Imagine you are sharing a Bible study series with your neighbors, your co-workers, your classmates, and you touch on the coming tribulation. You must get ready for the coming tribulation. And then... They were once told that those who are faithful will be raptured from this earth before the tribulation. How impactful would your Bible study be on giving up sin to pass the time of the great tribulation? It would fall flat. And likewise, you're telling them, Get victory over sin now. But they were once taught. Even if I'm unrepentant at the second coming of Christ, when Jesus comes, I'll have a second chance. Again, how impactful would your Bible study be on people who believe these false doctrines? We have come to save, to serve, center of evangelism. So we must understand what Satan is doing to prepare individuals to reject Bible truth, reject present truth, reject the truth for the hour. Blue words. Secret rapture left behind. It is based on even, they say, interpretation of prophecies in what books of the Bible? In what books? Daniel Revelation, Isaiah, Ezekiel. I'm going to put Sister Henriquez on the hot seat right now on the spot. Do you remember several years ago back at Greeley Avenue down there? 
and we were witnessing to our neighbors, and we were having a Bible study one evening, and as I was sharing the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks prophecy, as I laid out the first six to nine weeks that brought us to the year A.D. A.D. when? A.D. 27, and now about to share the final prophetic week, seven years. He said to me, no, 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 no. That last prophetic week did not transpire between 27 A.D., Christ's baptism, and the stoning of Stephen, seven years, the stoning of Stephen in A.D. 34. No, that last prophetic week, seven years, will transpire at the end of the world. When the faithful church will be, would be secretly raptured up and the last week of Daniel 9, verse 24, verse 27, would, will take place for those who aren't prepared. Brothers and sisters, I literally scratch my head. Why? This false teaching was nullifying the truth that God had sent me to teach. It was so riveted in his mind. Stop right there. Come back here, friends. All right. So note, must we know what we believe? All right. Who knows Jerry Falwell? You remember the big fallout at Liberty University? The scandal there? Jerry Falwell, who is he, by the way? Listen to this. It's important of who the messenger is so we can understand how impactful are his words. Jerry Falwell, Southern Baptist. By the way, that's the largest Protestant denomination in America. Do they have influence? Yes. That means you might meet a Southern Baptist as you are doing missionary work. All right, next. Red, blue words, all blue words. He's a televangelist. Jerry Falwell, next. A conservative, next. Mega church pastor back in the day. Next, he founded Liberty what? University. Also co-founded the Moral Majority. How powerful are those people? Red words, he says now, on the book, left behind, he says, in terms of its impact on Christianity, the left behind book, it's probably greater than that of what? Any other book in modern times outside of the Bible. Beloved, so how many people we might meet who believe in a secret rapture, who believe in left behind, who believe they'll have a second time of probation after the second coming of Christ. Must we know what we believe? Watch this. There it is, left behind. Look at the words on the line read. In the left behind books, this period started within a month after the rapture. Come on down. It is during this period the sealing takes place. The trumpet judgments are released. The bowel judgments, the seven, in other words, they won't be alive when they won't be on earth, they won't be on earth when the seven last plagues are being put out. Brothers and sisters, what event triggers, brings the seven last plagues? The mark of the beast, the national Sunday law. Are we to give up sin to make it through the time of the seven last plagues? Plagues, yes or no? Yes. Is Christ going to rapture the church before the seven last plagues? No. Or will God's people be here? Amen. We'll be here, but they believe they won't be here. So what will happen to your Bible studies and your sermons and your teachings? They have no effect on people who believe in the left behind false doctrine. Look at this corner. Words on the line, along with the abomination of desolation 
and the mark of the beast. <laughs> this period is also called what? Daniel's, uh, Daniel's what? Daniel's uh, 70th week from Daniel chapter 9. Yet, when it's time for Bible studies at church, how many people absent themselves? At the same time, they want to be trained as gospel medical missionaries. You must know what the errors are in people's hearts so you can remove the error and bring them God's special, marvelous light, God's truth for these closing moments of earth's history. First Peter chapter 4. Go there with me, my friends. Where are we going to? The Catholics also have their teaching that is connected to left behind, a second chance. What is that? Purgatory. What does purgatory mean? The process of purgatory is the final purification of the elect. Look at this, my friends. The Roman, red words, the Roman Catholic tradition of purgatory as a transitional condition has a history that dates back even before whom? Jesus Christ to the worldwide practice of caring for the dead and what? Praying for the dead. Why would they want to pray for the dead? Last sentence, that prayer for the dead contributed to their what? After life, purification, after death, the dead have a second chance. What's our mission? To call people from Babylon. First Peter chapter 4. Beloved, write down 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 6. I want to ask you a question here. If the Bible says the gospel was preached to the dead, what does that mean? Huh? After they died or before they died? Look at verse 6. This is one of the scriptures they use to prove you must pray for the dead. And once you die, you'll have a second chance, a second probation. Verse number 6. For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. What does that mean? It could mean the gospel was preached to those who are already dead. Or it was preached to them who are presently Dead, they receive the gospel opportunity before they died. So which one is correct? The latter. Why not the former? The Bible says, for the dead know not anything. And beloved, put this down. Probation simply means a test. Probation means a trial. Again, probation means a test. Probation means a trial. And since they believe there is going to be a second probation, it implies that there was a first probation. A what? Talk to me. A first probation. So question, who received the first test, the first trial based on Scripture? Talk to me, my friends. What were their names? Adam. And Eve, go there, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and verse 17. But Adam and Eve sinned. Adam and Eve failed. That test, they didn't pass that first probation. And Jesus said, in the day that you eat thereof, in the day that you disobey, you shall surely die. So why did Adam and Eve not die immediately? Why? Why? 
Very, very important. Why? Plan. What plan? Because Jesus had already promised, if man should sin, I would die and give man a second probation, a second probation. Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 8. All right, friends, put that down. Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 8. I will die and give man, the human race, a second probation. But now watch, scoffers, the ignorant say, since Jesus gave Adam and Eve a second chance after they sinned, if I am found unrepentant, at the second coming of Christ, that same God, that same God, that same God will also give me a second chance. It's more than presumption because they have Bible for that. Watch this. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 8, after Adam and Eve sinned, what did they hear? That implied that God, Christ, was approaching. What did they hear? They heard the voice of God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. Hold on. And then Adam and Eve hid themselves. Beloved, these scoffers and false prophets, they'll give you a Bible. Do you know why? At the second coming of Christ, what will we hear? The voice of God. First, Thess watch First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says, uh, it says, uh, and what? And the Lord himself shall descend with a what? A shout, with the voice of the ark angel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's one connection. And they are correct. Adam and Eve hid themselves. What will the unrepentant do? At the second coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 6. They got Bible. Verse 14 through verse 17. And the heavens departed as a scroll. When it is rolled together, and every free man, every uh, bondman, every king, and everyone, what? Hid themselves in the dens, in the rocks, and said, what? Mountains, uh, rocks, do what? Fall on us and hide us. They have Bible. So what's the difference, brothers and sisters? What's the difference? Since God gave Adam and Eve a second chance in a scene that typifies the second coming of Christ. If I am found unrepentant, that same God, that same God will also give me a second chance. Do you see it now? They got Bible. Know your Bible. All right. What makes the difference? Here it is. Before they sinned, there was a promise that Christ would die. How many times would Christ die? Put it down. Christ promised he would die once. Here's my point, friends. For Christ to give the human race a second chance, Jesus had to die. Jesus had to die. There is no scripture in the Bible that says Christ would die a second time. Put it down. There's no scripture that tells us that Jesus will have to die a second time. Since Jesus won't die a second time, it means there's no second chance after we die. No second chance after the second coming of Christ. It is now we must surrender all to Christ. Romans chapter 6. Go there with me. Are these points clear, friends? 
Are these points clear? All of us are called to be medical, missionary, evangelists. We're all called to be soul winners, Bible workers. Know what you believe while come to church and talk about a spiritual war. But there's no preparation. In, in the Ukraine right now, the president is asking all males, 16, I heard, 16 years of age and above, to come to this particular place to receive arms. Yes, AKs, some 45s, some pump actions. You get the point. Where are we going to? Leave guns alone. Where are we going to? Romans. And the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds. We are in a war. Amen. And the dragon was wroth and went to make war. Do we know what we believe? Romans 6. Where are we going to, friends? Look at verse 9. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, what now? Dieth no more. Death hath no more. Dominion over Christ, verse 10, for in that Jesus died, he died unto sin twice, twice, twice. I must have NIV Bible, twice. I must have the new K King James Version, twice. New Living Translation, twice. Good word, twice. Clear word Bible, twice. No, I got a King James Version Bible, he would die once. Put down, put down. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. What did I say, friends? Write this down. Quotation. It says, Bluebirds, Jesus did not die on the cross to abolish the law of God, but to secure what? But to secure for man. A second probation. May I clarify something for you? When Adam and Eve sinned, God gave to the human race a second probation. A slight nuance. When you and I were born, between birth and death, we only have one probation. Between birth and if we're alive at the second coming, it's only one probation. Did you see the difference between second probation? The human race does have a second probation because Adam and Eve sin, but individually, we won't have a second probation. To give probation, Christ had to die to give us in the future. Christ will have to die. And the Bible says that Christ will die how many times? How many times? What text you put down? First Peter what? First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Last sentence. Jesus did not die to make sin an immortal attribute. No, no, no. He died to secure the right. Oh, brothers and sisters, look at this. Christ proposed to become man's surety and substitute that man through matchless grace should have another trial, another trial, a what? A second probation. The Bible does not teach at the second coming of Christ, we will have a second chance. The Bible says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Revelation 22, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be. Righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be what? Holy still. Verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward 
is with me to give unto every man according as his work shall be. Does that tell us at the second coming? We have a second chance? Uh-uh. If you are filthy, remain filthy still. You're holy? Remain holy still. No second chance. May I give you one more? That second You need to take notes. I want to afford to, People go to the store and they want to buy milk or some juice and they want the one that is fortified <laughs> with minerals and vitamins. Beloved, in a spiritual sense, we want our minds to be what? Fortified. Not with cow's milk. No, fortified with the sincere, the sincere milk of the word with what? Strong, strong, strong meat of the word. Pastor, I drank some cow's milk this morning. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9. But the Bible teaches at the point of death, there's no second chance. Give them Bible, not opinions. Give them what? Bible. Give them Bible. We have come to a time, people attend churches, and they, if they walk with the Bible, the Bible hardly is turned. The leaves don't even turn when they go to church. Imagine that. And that's why they stop walking with Bibles. Young people, my sister, stop walking with Bibles. Parents, they stop walking with Bibles. Why? The pastors aren't encouraging them to go precept upon precept, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. <laughs> so why carry Bibles if you're not using it? What do you do with things you don't use in your house? Huh? You get a box from Home Depot and Lowe's and some people put camphor balls in the boxes so your sheets and spread will remain but you're hurting yourself health wise you put stuff you don't use in boxes and you put it where in the corner somewhere and that's what many are doing with their what with their bibles that was your commercial break <laughs> hebrews Chapter 9, look with me, at verse number 26. Are we there, friends? For then must Jesus often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, now, how much times will he suffer? Once. Verse 27, and as it is appointed unto men, how many times to die? Once to die. But after this what? The judgment is the executive judgment. The one's death means a natural death. But then comes what? Ju what judgment? For the unrepentant. A death from which they will not return. Verse 28. So Christ. So who? So Christ. So who? So Christ. Twice. Offered, oh, brothers, oh, let's make sure. So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall Christ appear, appear the second time with or without sin. Which one? With or without sin. It says uh, without sin. If it was uh, with sin. Christ bears sin because his people are still confessing their sins. He bears the sins because we are confessing our sins. But at the second coming of Christ, he's not bearing sins. Why? Not only because they are blotted out for the uh, for the repentant, but because there's no second chance. Romans chapter 8, brothers and sisters. Where are we going to? Ah, oh, beloved. Beloved, one great reason why Jesus 
cannot give us a second chance because he gave us everything in the first place to give the human race a second opportunity. He has nothing more to give. That's a powerful statement to make. Look at the screen. Let me see how much more of this I want to give you. Red words on top. It is what, friends? Impossible for men to secure the salvation of the soul. When? When? Romans chapter 8. Let the Bible speak, my friends. Look with me at verse number 32. How much did Christ give us, my friends? Please, take your writing instrument. Take your writing instrument. Come on. Take your, look at the statement here. This is Romans 8 and verse number 32. The blue words, the blue words, the blue words. He gave us all the Father. When he gave us Christ, look at the red words. There was nothing held in reserve. <laughs> no second probation will ever be provided. He gave everything. When Christ died, there's no box in some corner. There's no reserve. No second chance. Luke chapter 16. How many of you recall the parable, the allegory of Lazarus and the rich man? Lazarus and the rich man. That allegory is also teaching us there's no second chance after death. Luke chapter 16. Where are we going to friends? Luke chapter 16. Look what Christ said in the allegory. You know what allegory means, right? I didn't hear you. You're yawning? Are, are you yawning, my sister? Or are you saying, give me more? <laughs> Look at verse 22 of Luke 16. It says, uh, the beggar man died, Lazarus, and the rich man died. All right? Look at verse number 24. And what did the rich man say as he was in the allegory in hell burning? Abraham, have what? Abraham, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. But what did Father Abraham say? In the allegory, there's no mercy available. In your lifetime, you had a chance to see your need and ask for mercy. And now you have died. Now you have died. You can ask for mercy. Look at verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have what? Have mercy on me. Look at verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, let's read. Remember that thou in thy what? So when is he asking for mercy? In the allegory. After he's dead. But what does Father Abraham, who represents Christ, in the allegory say? You had a lifetime to ask for mercy. So when must we ask for mercy? When? Now. By the way, verse 26, and beside all this, between us and you, there's what? A great gulf fixed. Your destiny has been fixed before you died. Fixed. But many will hear this and still say, you know, Pastor, you know I would live my life right now. And just in case I don't believe this present truth. Let me say it this way. Many folks don't believe what we're preaching. Mark of the... Oh, we don't, we don't want to hear that. Many of your family members despise you, criticize you. They call you offshoots. They call you fanatics. Many of you, your husband or wife has left you. 
because you stood for this Bible truth. Children have forsaken you. Parents have disenfranchised you. Am I lying? Am I lying? And many of them, in the back of their minds, are still thinking, is what, is what they're saying really true? And they brush the truth aside. And when the mark of the beast comes, brothers and sisters, and the plagues are falling, how many at that time will say, have mercy on me. At that time, their probation has already been closed. Wake up, friends. It's no joke. No joke. Imagine, some are going to say, if I'm found unrepentant, at the second coming of Christ, if Christ were to give me a second chance, I would repent. How many do you think would, would say that today? How many do you think would say that today? Peradventure, I live my life partying, doing whatever I want to do, wear whatever I want to wear, eat whatever I want to wear, drink and smoke whatever. Whatever, whatever, whatever. No church, what, whatever. And if what Andrew, Henriquez, and others are saying is true, if I'm found unrepentant at the second coming of Christ, I will repent. If Christ gives me a second chance, beloved, the Bible says you would not repent if given a second chance. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful. Above all things, and desperately wicked. And who can know it? We don't even know our hearts. But now watch, I haven't given you the nail in a sure place yet. You won't repent, even if Christ were to give you a second chance. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse number 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Oh, brothers and sisters, it says, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. If you received a second chance at the second coming of Christ, you still would not repent. Beloved, you would hate Christ still, despise his truth still. You would call CNN and say, Pastor Enriquez is not in good and regular standing still. You would see the saints and try to persecute them still. Let's prove that. Revelation 20. Beloved, is this not the scene of the second resurrection of the unrepentant? In Revelation 20, the 1,000 years has passed. The second resurrection takes place. And the Bible says now, Satan is loosed. He's now loosed from his prison. And what does Satan do? He deceives again the unrepentant. And what do they now do? They march over the breadth of the earth. For what purpose? To surrender? To rebel against Christ. To rebel against the faithful to rebel against grace, kick over the Holy Spirit, to champion over God and his son, they will not surrender if given a second chance. Don't fool yourself, friends. Don't fool yourself. We're now living 
in something called the great controversy between Christ and Satan. This only has one chapter, one episode, one episode to give the unrepentant a second chance after Christ says it is done, after the second coming of Christ would in actuality create a second rebel, a second Satan, a second war, because the unrepentant will not repent. It would be the great controversy between Christ and Satan, part two. Jesus is not in Hollywood. Volume 5 says that Christ and Satan never work in co-partnership. Mm -mm. And if great controversy, part 2, still doesn't make the unrepentant repentant, then what will come? A third chance. The great controversy, part 3, Get your popcorn, your soda, part three. That's hogwash, malarkey. Do you want this? And the Bible says in Nahum chapter one and verse nine, affliction will not rise a second time. Affliction, hold on, what led to affliction? Sin. Sin would not rise a second time. But who also was afflicted? Christ was afflicted because of my sin. Because of your sin, affliction shall not rise when a second time, Isaiah. 26, look at this, my friends. Great controversy, page 662, watch. As the wicked went into their graves, I saw some of you like wink a while ago and, beloved, where are you going? It's a Sabbath, where are you going? <laughs> As the wicked went into their graves, so they come forth with the same enmity to Christ. And the same spirit of what? Rebellion. They are to have no new probation in which to remedy the defects of their lives, past lives. Nothing would be gained by what? A second probation. Listen, a lifetime of transgression has not softened their hearts. A second probation, were it given them, would be occupied as was the first, as was the first, in evading the requirements of God and exciting what? Rebellion. The great controversy, part two. But there's no second Chance, say that with me. No second chance. Isaiah, what chapter are we going to? 26. Isaiah 26. The Bible says, uh, many say, if I get a second chance, I would repent. The Bible says, uh, even if favor is shown to the wicked, the wicked will still not learn righteousness. The wicked will still not learn righteousness. Where are we going to, friends? Isaiah 26. Look with me. At verse number 9, it says, uh, with my soul. No, go to verse 10. Verse 10, let the whom? Let the wicked, uh, pardon me, let favor, let what, friends? Let favor be showed. To the wicked. Let's read. Yet what, friends? Yet will he not learn 
righteousness in the land of uprightness will he deal how? If God were to bring the unrepentant to heaven in the new earth, how would they live? How would they live? Brothers and sisters, is that Bible? Let favor be shown them in the land of uprightness. They would live unjustly. Now it makes sense. Revelation 22, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Behold, I come quickly. There's no second chance. You remember Pharaoh? Prime example. Did God not send light and truth to Pharaoh? Let my people go. Obey God's voice. Pharaoh said, who is God that I should obey his voice? All right. God said now, Moses, show him my power. Throw down your rod. He will have his apostates, magicians, throw down their rods. All rods became serpents, but God's rod devoured Pharaoh's rod. So who was better? <laughs> who was more powerful? God. But Pharaoh rebelled. And God sent the first plague. And Pharaoh began to plead with Moses. Ask that God for favor for me. And God showed him favor. And remove the first plague. What did Pharaoh do next? What did Pharaoh do next? He went back to rebel against God. Let favor be shown to the wicked. Yet they will rebel and rebel. Pharaoh did not get one chance. Pharaoh did not get two chances. Pharaoh did not get three chances. How many plagues? Mm. Fail on Egypt. Ten plagues. How many chances that Pharaoh received? Brothers, and that's the finishing nail in a short place. There's no second chance. Volume 1, page 81. Tomorrow is medical missionary evangelism for the community and for ourselves. Some people who are sick, God is not going to heal you. Because if he were to heal you, you'd go right back. You would return to the same lifestyle practices that brought the disease. And that's why we are not here to make people healthy sinners. Uh -uh. No. But healthy Christians. Amen. Volume 1, page 81 says, I was forcibly reminded of deathbed repentance. Some serve themselves and Satan all their lives. But as soon as sickness consumes them, or a certain uncertainty is before them, oh, they manifest some sorrow for sin and say they are willing to die. And their friends make themselves believe that they have been truly converted and fitted for heaven. But 
If these should recover, they would be as rebellious as ever. Just to make sure, I gave her the full quote. Volume 1, come off my screen. Page 81, what says those blue words, my friends? Death, bed, repentance. Look at the red words, red words. But if these should recover, they would be how? As rebellious as ever. So for some individuals, Jesus is saying, no second chance. You would die with that sickness and die lost. No second chance. Mercy. How many of you have been sick? Don't raise your hand. And God gave you a second chance. You can't hold it in, huh? You can't hold it in. Well, let's say amen. How many of you have been diagnosed with something that would bring you to the grave? And God gave you a second chance. If that's you, say amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, second chance? Mm -mm. Let's make do with the one chance. With the one chance. This is our only chance. And some are going to say, oh God, give me a second chance. To preach a second chance is to say that the unrepentant did not receive a fear chance. The theory of left behind, purgatory, secret rapture, Second probation is actually saying some people did not receive a fear chance. I have friends, past friends, who are now in the grave. They died when they were 16, 17, 18. I always wondered, did they receive a fear chance? One thing is certain, nobody is going to die Thank you. Without first receiving a chance to surrender all to Jesus Christ. Let me give you a Bible. for. Go to Ecclesiastes with me. Where are we going to? Chapter 9. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes, chapter 9. Look with me. At verse number 10, the context of verse 10 is death. Let's read that together. It says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy what? Thy might. For there is no work, no device, nor knowledge, no wisdom. In the grave, whither soever thou goest. Look at verse 11. What's the last phrase in verse 11? After it says, uh, the race is not for the swift, but awkward academy. Want us to believe that sports is of God? What will you win if you don't move swiftly? In competitive sports. I wish I could say more. But the race is not for the swift. Nor the battle to the strong. Neither yet bread to the wise. Nor yet riches to men of understanding. Let's read now what it says, my friends. Nor yet favor to men of skill. But what? But time. And chance, what's that word? Time. And chance happeneth to some, to few, to all, the Bible says. Time and chance for how many people? For every single person. God is fair. God is fair. One Chance. 
Titus 2. Right now, I'll give you a plethora of scriptures. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto some men, unto all men. 1 Corinthians, pardon me, Colossians, Colossians, chapter 1, verse 23. The gospel must be preached to every creature under heaven. Time and chance for everyone. Does that make sense? And now, Matthew 22, verse 11 and verse 12. Christ said, How comest thou in hither? Not having on the wedding garment. And what did that man say, my friends? He said nothing. The Bible says uh, he was speechless. Why? He received time to surrender, but did not. He received a chance to surrender, but did not. He was speechless. Time and chance now. Why? There's no second chance. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. No second chance. Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, verse 9. Today, when? Today, salvation is come to your house. Save to serve international online and first time viewers. Now, today, salvation is come to your house. Today, those of you locally, salvation is come to your house. Is he knocking? Will you let him in? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, verse 8. Jesus says, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your hearts. Will you surrender all to Christ? Now notice now, there is a, a primary truth that God is saying. Don't harden your heart and reject. It's the seventh day Sabbath. Look at Hebrews 4, how we compare scripture. Do you see in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 6 and verse number 7? Look at verse 7. Today, if you hear my voice, what must you not do? Don't harden your hearts. What's the context of Hebrews 4? Verse 4 through verse 11. God's seventh day Sabbath. Hold on. Do you know how many are going to be aroused when the plagues begin to fall upon all none? Seventh-day Sabbath worshipers, we are told. It is then many are going to realize the seventh-day Sabbath is God's seal of salvation. But they won't have. But they won't have a second chance. And the seven-day Sabbath represents a finished work. A what, friends? A finished work. What work? Oh, 
Does Jesus want us to allow him to finish in us? What work? What work? The work of salvation. Salvation being saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin. Number two, Matthew 21. Go work today. When? Today. In my vineyard. Here's my point. Many of us who profess to be Seventh-day Adventists, many of us who profess to be anti-missionaries, we're moving so slow as snail, so slow as blackstrap molasses, as if the people who need the gospel will have a second chance after death. We are just dragging our feet slowly to do God's work, as if the people in the communities will have a second chance at the second coming of Christ. Now that you know there's no second chance, what must we be about? Our father's business follow me, says Jesus, and I will make you what? Fishers of men. It's time, brothers and sisters. So now I close. Joshua 24 and verse 15. What did Joshua say? Choose you tomorrow. That's NIV, Pastor. Choose you today. When? Today. Whom you will serve. As to me and Hillary, as to me and Christian, as to me and Faith, as to me and my mother, as to me and my, I don't know, grandmother, as to me and my house, house, church, as to me and saved to serve local here in Georgia. As a me and my house, church. As a me and save to serve, international, online. As a me, finish it. And my house, we will serve whom? The Lord. The Lord, Jesus Christ. Beloved, has he taken you from Babylon? Has he taken you from Egypt? Has Christ delivered you from bondage? Captivity? Has Christ brought you through the Red Sea? Baptism? Has Christ allowed you to be baptized? Has Christ brought you through the Jordan? The Jordan, a double baptism. That's rebaptism. Has Christ done this for you? Has Christ brought you to a land of vineyards, grapes, grape, grape juice? The true doctrine. Grape, blood. Blood, his life. Has Christ brought you to a church to receive his life? Has Christ brought you to a land to receive olives, olives, oil? Oil, the Holy Spirit, has Christ brought you to a place here in, a, in Georgia, online? Has Christ brought you to a place to receive olives? The Holy Spirit, truth, comfort, that's the setting of Joshua 24, verse 1 through verse 14. Look at God's love. Look what God has done for you. Look, now he makes the appeal. Choose you. He said, look at me. Don't procrastinate. Choose you when? 
February 26, 2022, whom you will serve. Have you chosen him today? Can you stand up and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? Amen. Husbands, if your wife is here, take her hand gently. I have a burden for families. Our what, friends? It is Satan's plan. Do you see how I dropped my voice to get through to you? It is Satan's plan to destroy marriages, to destroy homes. As for me and my house, we will serve God. Husbands, husbands, husbands. And if there's no daddy, husband here, mothers, just bring your children close to you. I'm going to make a, 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 a dedicatory prayer for families. For families. Hillary, draw near. Christian, draw near. Faith, draw near. Draw near. Draw near. Families, draw near. And if you don't have a biological family member with you today, welcome to Save to Serve. Amen. Welcome to Jesus. We're all family. Rise from your seats. Come close. Let's have this dedicatory prayer. Lord, this prayer of consecration. This prayer of consecration. For families. For families. For families. For families. Come on. For families. I want my mother up here. I want my wife up here. I want children. Come right here. On my right hand, right here. Come stand by me. We're going to pray today, friends. We're going to pray. Husbands, yes, 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 yes. Today, God wants to save families. That's what he told Zac Zacchaeus. Today, salvation is come to your house. When Elijah comes in the message, he comes to prepare the house, the family, the family. Psalm 68, he puts the solitary in families. Kneel with me as we spend a few moments in prayer. Those of you who are contemplating baptism, how much longer will you procrastinate? Today, will you choose to be a part of the upcoming baptismal classes, preparing for baptism. If so, send us an email. We'll add your name, give you the credentials, and you'll be a part of the baptismal class. Time and chance for every one of you. There's no second chance. This is it. If you knew you'd die tomorrow, how would you live today? You have time today, chance today. How would you live today if you were to die when you leave here and drive out? How would you live today? Well, today is your time. Today is your chance. Father in heaven, We come as a household. We come as a household of faith. We come also individually, surrendering all to you. Thank you for this word that challenged us today. Thank you for this time and chance. Thank you for accepting our confessions. We accept your pardon. We accept justification. 
you would treat us today as if we never sinned. We accept your power to go and sin no more. We accept your proposal. You want to marry us. And today, we say, I do. Will you marry me? I do. Will you marry me, says Jesus. Church, we say, I do. I do. I do. I do. I, do. I pray for every husband, every wife, every family, every children. Consecrate, save us. And those who have no uh, biological kinship in this movement, we accept them as you have promised to put the solitary in families. We love you. We love you. Thank you for holding back nothing. Thank you for emptying the reserve to give us a second probation as a human race. And today, in our own first and only probation, only chance, we say, Lord, you gave all, we give you all. Seal every decision for baptism. Seal every decision for rebaptism. And when all is said and done, when you come, may all of us here, your people online, rise, rise to meet you in the air. And so will we be with you forever. Comfort one another with these words, with these words. Lord, we love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the church said, Amen. come on, friends, raise your hand to Christ. And the church said, Amen. 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 All right, friends.